Welcome back, everyone, to the deep dive. Ready to get a little, oh, deep? Always up for a deep dive. Today we're going where most people would rather not. Ooh, sounds intriguing. We're talking advanced directives. Ah, yeah, that's, uh, that's one of those things everyone knows they should be thinking about. Right, but it's not exactly a light dinner conversation. No, not really. But hey, that's what we're here for, to make these tough topics a bit more approachable. Exactly. And to help us out, we've got these sources from two totally different places, the U.S. and Catalonia, Spain. Wow, across the pond. That's cool. I'm curious to see how those perspectives differ, you know, with cultural differences and all. Yeah, me too. But what struck me right away is that despite being worlds apart, they both agree on one fundamental thing. What's that? Making sure your voice is heard when it comes to your health care, even if you can't speak for yourself. Oh, that's powerful. I mean, that's really the whole point of an advanced directive, isn't it? Yeah. It's like a safeguard. So no matter what happens, your wishes are known. Exactly. And they both use a few different terms for it. You'll hear things like living will or medical power of attorney. Right, right. I've heard those terms thrown around, but honestly, I'm a little fuzzy on the details. Yeah, no worries. I was too before I really dug into this. So to break it down. Please do. A medical power of attorney basically means you're legally choosing someone to make medical decisions for you if you're ever unable to. Oh, okay. That makes sense. So it's like giving someone the authority to speak on your behalf. Exactly. So whether it's called a living will, an advanced directive, or medical power of attorney, the goal is the same. Gotcha. So it's all about making sure your healthcare wishes are followed no matter what. Exactly. So step one, you need to pick that trusted person, right? Your healthcare agent. Oh. And this is a big decision. Huge. This is the person who will be in the hot seat making those tough calls. I mean, have you thought about who that would be for you? Honestly, it's something I've been putting off. It feels like oh, oh. a lot of pressure to put on someone. Oh. I hear you are. And the thing is, it's not just about finding someone you trust. It's also about finding someone who can handle that pressure, mm -hmm. you know, as someone who's emotionally prepared for such a heavy responsibility. And who can really make decisions that align with your values, not their own. Right. Exactly. It's tricky, for sure. You might trust someone completely, but are they really cut out to make those kinds of calls? And get this, our U.S. source even mentions that sometimes your treating doctor can't be your agent because of potential conflicts of interest. Oh, wow. I hadn't thought of that. So it's really crucial to think this through carefully, like really have open conversations with potential agents. Absolutely. Make sure they're comfortable discussing these topics, you know, yeah. and that they truly understand what you want. Makes sense. So choosing the right person is key. But then the next layer is like, well, what are we even talking about here? What treatments are on the table? Right. And both sources lay out a whole bunch of options. CPR, breathing machines, dialysis, feeding tubes. It's a lot. Yeah, that's heavy stuff. I could see how that would make people nervous. For sure. But the point they're both making is that you have the right to refuse a nitty treatment, even life-saving ones. Whoa, really? Even if it means? Yeah, even then. It's about understanding your options and making informed choices that align with your desired quality of life. Oh, so it's not just about living longer. It's about how you live. Bingo. And that brings us to the heart of it. Life support. It can be a real dilemma. Yeah, I could see that. When does it become more about prolonging suffering than promoting healing, you know, and how do you even begin to weigh quality of life versus quantity? Those are the million dollar questions, right? And honestly, I think it's natural to feel a little squeamish thinking about all this. Oh, absolutely. This stuff is heavy. And the Catalan source even encourages us to embrace those fears, to acknowledge them. Hmm, that's interesting. Why would I want to write down all my fears, you know, like put them out there? I think it's about taking away their power. By naming those fears, by being upfront about them, you're taking control of a situation that can often feel very out of control. I see, I see. So by acknowledging the scary stuff, we're actually making the whole process less scary. Exactly. It's about honesty and transparency. It's about saying, hey, these are my fears and this is how I want them addressed. Okay, I like that. It's like shining a light on the darkness, you know? Yeah, exactly. And both sources emphasize that having those fears in writing gives valuable context to your healthcare agent and loved ones. Makes sense. So if we're going to tackle those fears head on, do the sources offer any guidance? Like, where do we even begin? Well, the U.S. source goes into some pretty intense what-if scenarios, which I think can be really helpful for pinpointing your specific concerns. Oh, like what? Well, for example, it asks you to imagine yourself with an incurable disease or facing a progressive condition like Parkinson's. 
Okay. Yeah, that's definitely getting into the heavy stuff. It is. But it's also designed to be eye-opening, to get you thinking about what really matters to you in those situations. I can see that. I mean, it's one thing to say you value quality of life, but it's another thing to really confront what that means in a specific scenario. Exactly. And the source goes even further. It prompts you to think about things like pain management preferences. Ooh, like would you want strong pain medication even if it might affect your mental clarity? Exactly. Or what would you want if you were in a coma with a slim chance of recovery? Man, these are tough questions. I can understand why people avoid them. Oh, for sure. I mean, who wants to think about these things? What? Right. But the sources are both saying that avoiding them doesn't make them go away. And that by facing them head on, you actually gain a sense of control. So it's not about dwelling on the negative, but about using those what ifs as a tool for self-discovery. Precisely. And both sources stress that your advanced directive isn't set in stone. You know, you can change or cancel at any time. Oh, good to know. So it's not like you're making these decisions in concrete. Nope, not at all. Life mm -hmm. is fluid and so are our preferences. The key is to just make sure everyone involved is up to date if you make any changes. Makes total sense. Okay, so I have to admit, when I was reading through the Catalan source, something really jumped out at me. They mention euthanasia as something to potentially consider. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's uh, that's definitely a topic that sparks a lot of debate. For sure. But it really highlights the need to stay informed about end-of-life options, especially as laws and societal views change. Absolutely. I mean, what's considered taboo in one place might be totally accepted in another. Exactly. So it's about being aware of your options and making choices that align with your own values. And speaking of choices, let's not forget all the practical stuff, right? Both sources mention things like organ donation, body donation, funeral wishes, even religious rituals. Yeah, it's like a whole checklist for the end of life, which honestly can be a bit overwhelming. Right. It's a lot to consider. Yeah. But the Catalan source has this important caveat. Not all of these wishes fall under the authority of medical professionals. Ah, okay, so like funeral arrangements and things like that. Exactly. Hey, Some hey. things might need to be handled through separate legal documents or family discussions. Right, so it's good to keep that in mind. Advanced directives are important, but they're just one piece of the puzzle. Totally. It's about having those tough conversations and making sure your wishes are known no matter what. Yeah, it's like a good reminder that advanced directives are important. Super important. But they're not the whole story. Not at all. It's all about having those hard conversations with your family. Yeah, and making sure everyone's on the same page. Really. Exactly. It's not just about we knowing what you want. It's about making sure your loved ones are in the loop, too. I mean, it's easy for us to sit here and talk about it like it's no big deal, but I'm sure for a lot of people, even bringing it up is, like, f super awkward. Oh, yeah, totally. It can feel really uncomfortable, even morbid. So what about those folks who just, like, really don't want to talk about this stuff? Well, the U.S. source actually addresses that head on. It says something like, imagine how much harder it would be for your family to have to guess what you want during a crisis. Oh, wow. That's a good point. It's kind of selfish to not have those conversations, even if they're tough. <laughs> right. It's really about taking the burden off your loved ones. I see. I see. OK, so let's say we've got the directive. We've talked to our family. What else can we do to, like, make sure things are crystal clear? Well, the Catalan source mentioned that some places have these registries where you can store your advanced directive electronically. Oh, that's smart. So it's accessible no matter what. Exactly. Like if you're traveling or something. Makes sense. So we talked about the what if scenarios from the U.S. source being a good way to start uncovering our values. Yeah, they're a good starting point for sure. But are there any other tools or like thought exercises that can help us figure out what we really want? The U.S. source has this one thought experiment that I found super interesting. Oh, yeah. What is it? Well, it asks you to imagine, like, what if you had an incurable disease? Would you want antibiotics for an infection that could be fatal? Well, okay, that got real serious real fast. I know, right? Uh -huh. But it forces you to really confront your values. Yeah, I get it. It's like, it's one thing to say, oh, yeah, quality of life is important to me. But it's another to think about what that actually means when you're faced with a life or death decision. Exactly. It's about getting specific, getting down to the nitty gritty. So it's less about predicting the future and more about like really understanding yourself. Exactly. And the thought experiment goes on to ask about things like feeding tubes for progressive conditions, how you feel about strong pain meds. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's getting pretty deep. It is. But it's designed to help you figure out where you stand on these issues. And to be clear, 
both sources say you can change your mind about any of this stuff, right? Like your directive isn't set in stone. Right, right. You can revise it, update it, whatever you need to do. Okay, good to know. It's not like signing your life away or anything. Nope, not at all. It's about having a plan in place, but mm -hmm. also being able to adapt as things change. Oh, I'm really starting to see how this can be empowering. You know, it's like yeah. taking control instead of just hoping for the best. Totally. It's about being proactive. It's interesting how both sources, even though they're from totally different parts of the world, are on the same page about so many of these things. Yeah, there's definitely a common thread running through both of them. But there are also some interesting cultural nuances, right? Like, the Catalan source brings up the idea of spiritual beliefs. Oh, that's right. They talk about incorporating your thoughts on illness and dying and even death itself into your directive. It's like they're acknowledging that end-of-life care isn't just about the physical body, it's about the whole person. Yeah, the spiritual and emotional sides, too. But what about folks whose religious beliefs might, like, actually discourage them from having an advanced directive? That's a really good point. The U.S. source actually mentions that some faith traditions might have different views on this. Hmm. So what's the advice for those individuals? The source suggests reaching out to clergy or spiritual advisors to find ways to ensure their wishes are honored, even within the framework of their faith. Oh, that's great. So it's not like a one-size-fits-all approach. Not at all. It's about finding what works for you and your beliefs. Okay, so we've covered a lot today. From choosing a healthcare agent to navigating those what-if scenarios, to thinking about the role of spiritual beliefs. We've really gone deep. It's been a whirlwind tour of advanced directives and everything they entail. But I think the most important thing to remember is that this isn't just for the elderly or the terminally ill. Yeah, advanced directives are for everyone. It's about taking control of your health care, no matter what stage of life you're in. You just never know what tomorrow might bring, right? And by being prepared, you're taking a huge weight off your loved one. Exactly. It gives them clarity and guidance when they need it most. Okay, so before we wrap up, I want to reiterate something we said earlier. These conversations don't have to be scary or depressing. Yeah, they can actually be really empowering. It's about understanding yourself, what you value, what's important to you. And using that knowledge to make informed decisions about your healthcare. So if you haven't already, take some time to think about these things. Talk to your family, consult with your doctor, maybe even seek legal advice. And remember, advanced directives aren't set in stone. You can update them as your needs change. What matters most is that you have one in place. Yeah, it's about having that peace of mind for you and for your loved ones. Advanced directives are a powerful tool. Don't wait until it's too late. Start the conversation today. And on that note, we'll wrap up this deep dive into advanced directives. We'll include links to resources and all that good stuff in the show notes. Awesome. Because remember, knowledge is power. The more informed you are, the better decisions you can make. Thanks for joining us on this journey. Until next time, keep exploring, keep questioning, and keep diving deep. It's funny, isn't it? We started off talking about advanced directives like it was all about planning for the end. Yeah, like this big scary thing looming on the horizon. But as we've been talking, it's become clear that it's so much more than that. Oh, absolutely. It's like, it's really about taking control of your healthcare journey, no matter what. Exactly. It's about understanding what you value and making sure those values are reflected in your care, even if you can't speak for yourself. It takes the guesswork out of it for everyone, you know, your loved ones, your doctors. Yeah, it's like you're giving them a roadmap saying, this is what's important to me. This is what I want. It can be such a gift, honestly, yeah. both for yourself and for those who care about you. And one thing I really appreciate is that both sources, even though they come from such different backgrounds, they both emphasize that these principles apply no matter where you live. That's right. The specifics might vary. The laws might be different. But the core message is universal. Your health care, your choices. And those choices are powerful. They really are. So if you're listening to this and thinking, OK, I need to get on this, where do you even start? Well, there are tons of resources out there. We'll be sure to include links in the show notes. Yeah, definitely check those out. There are forms, guides, legal advice, all sorts of stuff. And don't be afraid to ask for help, you know? Talk mm. to your doctor, a lawyer, even a spiritual advisor. Yeah, if you've got questions, reach out. There are people who can help guide you through this process. And remember, it's not a one-time thing. You can always go back and update your dance directive as your needs and values change. That's such a good point. Life is constantly evolving, so it makes sense that our preferences would too. Exactly. The key is to stay engaged in the conversation with yourself, your loved ones, your healthcare providers. So as we wrap up this deep dive into advanced directives, 
I want to leave you with this thought. It's not about dwelling on the negative. It's not about fearing the future. It's about empowerment. Yes. It's about taking control of your healthcare journey and making sure your voice is heard. It's about peace of mind for you and for everyone who cares about you. So go out there, start those conversations, and make those choices. You've got this. And that's a wrap on another deep dive. Thanks for joining us. Until next time, keep exploring, keep questioning, and keep diving deep.